Okay, so I'll be talking this morning about um, what I'm going to call the cognitive non-conscious. And this is indeed, in a certain sense, thinking about thinking. So I'll begin with uh, John Cyril's famous Chinese room thought experiment. Cyril intended this as an example showing why computers can't actually think. So in the Chinese room, there's a man who sits there. Through one slot in the door, he gets a string of Chinese characters. He has a rule book. Using the rule book, he makes some uh, changes in the string, and then he puts his modified string in the output. Someone on the outside has asked a question who knows Chinese, and the output is then the answer to the question that uh, the person asked in Chinese. But actually, um, what Cyril meant this to illustrate was that we, what we call thought in computers is just this sterile and mechanical matching process. But he misconstrued the situation because the cognition here is not in the man. The man is a very powerful cognizer right in the middle of this situation. The cognition here is in the system as a whole. And what this suggests is a kind of fundamental change in how we think about cognition from cognition being located in the individual to cognition being located in a system. This is an example of a termite mound. A termite mound is a complex architectural structure. Each termite only has a few instincts in its head, but by laying down pheromone, pheromone trails and engaging in these instincts, the individual termites create a system that has complex emergent effects, that is, the creation of the termite mound. And so we can now think about a cognitive system as, or a an agent in a cognitive system, as a constraint-driven complex adaptive system. Each of those modifiers has connotations that I'll just briefly spin out. The fact that it's a complex system means you have many independent agents interacting with one another and that you may have results that cannot be predicted from the elements of the system but emerge through their complex interactions. It's adaptive in the sense that it can adapt to changes in its environment and it's constraint-driven because when you get in a situation like this, linear causality doesn't take you very far. It's impossible to model systems like this through explicit mathematical equations, for example. Because the interactions are so complex, linear causality doesn't work. So instead, when you're modeling these systems and when you're understanding these systems, the way you model them is through a bunch of agents autonomous agents, simple rules, interacting generate complexity within constraints. And the constraints direct the ways in which this emergence can take place. So now we've been sort of introducing what the cognitive non-conscious be, might be. Let's now change to the other mode, that is conscious thought. Everyone who writes about consciousness, and this is obviously a huge topic, uh, defines at least two different levels of consciousness. One is core or primary consciousness. Uh, this mode of awareness is shared among humans, primates, and many mammals. But in addition, there's higher level consciousness, and this is, if not unique to humans, certainly more developed in humans than any other species. Higher consciousness includes the ability to, con to uh, conceptualize the self, to reflect on the self as a self, and of course this leads to language, manipulation of symbols, and so forth. Now how do we talk about the neural correlates to the cognitive non-conscious, the core conscious, and the higher conscious? One of the researchers who's done that is Gerald Edelman, uh, winner of the Nobel Prize for his work on a theory of neural Darwinism. And effectively, Edelman is trying to explore through experimental and modeling work 
uh, how do you get from the individual neuron to something like Mozart's uh, music? So we start, of course, at the most elementary level with a neuronal cell. Uh, both co the cognitive non-conscious, core consciousness, and higher consciousness are underlaid by material processes. So if we ask what is the difference between the material process and the cognitive non-conscious, the material process does not have an intention toward. It is not adaptive. It cannot change with changes its environment. So we might think, for example, of a glacier sliding downhill. The glacier is not adaptive. The glacier does not have emergent behaviors. The glacier can't decide to go in the shady valley instead of the sunny valley and so forth. So the neuronal cell here is at the level of a material process. But neuronal cells gather together in clusters. They're neural Darwinism because these clusters expand and grow when they are stimulated. Those that are not stimulated die off. And these clusters together create maps. Then scenes are created out of maps. Then primary consciousness out of scenes, secondary consciousness out of the content of primary consciousness. So if we were lo to locate in this schema the cognitive non-conscious, which spans humans, animals, and technological devices, we would locate it in human neurology somewhere between the map and the scene. Now, consciousness is such a marvelous evolutionary adaptation that we're accustomed to having it praised and patting ourselves on the back. We're conscious entities. But uh, within the last couple of decades, a lot of research has been going into the costs of consciousness. These are some of the costs of consciousness. It's energetically expensive. It's a glucose, glucose hog to keep all that sophisticated neurology going. It's slow relative to perception, the notorious missing half second. It takes a full half second for consciousness to gloam onto what perception has already sensed. And it has a very strong bias towards selfhood and individuality. So Tony Damasio, for example, emphasizes that consciousness is deeply tied into the idea of the individual and about the self in the broad term. In fact, we could say that you cannot have a sense of self without consciousness. So all of the costs that we might associate with the idea of the self and the individual are, by implication, associated with consciousness as well. In his book, Being No One, Thomas Metziger has some very useful ways to think about how consciousness evolves. He advocates the claim nobody ever had or was a self, a claim, I, by the way, I don't agree with, but I'll explicate it in just a minute. So Metziger um, talks about the ability of consciousness to form a model of the self. So conscious entities have an idea of themselves as actors. They have a, a model of what he calls the intentionality relation, that is, of the self in relation to an object. His point is that the self is incapable of realizing it is the emergent effect from these models. In other words, the models are invisible to the self, even though the self is the result of the models. So he uses this to argue that the self, in fact, doesn't exist. All that exists are the underlying material processes. So the self is a kind of false reification for Metzinger. My own view is that the self may well be an epiphenomenon rather than a phenomenon. But because it's an epiphenomenon, it's no less real in our psychic life than as if, if it were a phenomenon. So basically, I don't buy his argument, but I think the way he uh, very rigorously defines consciousness through these formation of models is very insightful. So one of the primary missions of consciousness in life is to maintain coherence. Here Edelman says uh, many neuro 
physiological disorders demonstrate that consciousness are bent, bent, can bend or shrink, but it does not tolerate breaks in coherence. This, in fact, is, seems to be one of the purposes of consciousness, and we can understand why maintaining coherence would have very strong adaptive advantage. But it also leads to a more or less conscious confabulation. That is, consciousness constantly confabulates. This becomes strikingly evident in the case of some neurological disorders that result from lesions in the brain. For example, people who can see only the left side of their face and not the right side. The visual perception is coming into the brain, but somehow, for some reason, it can't be cannot enter consciousness. So men, for example, with this disorder will only shave the left side of their face. And if you ask someone suffering from this disorder, what is that picture over on the right wall, they will say, there is no picture on the right wall. But if you persist and you say, well, if there were a picture, what would it be about? The subject will say something like, well, it might be about a sunflower. And of course, it is a sunflower. So in some way, the information is there in the brain, but it's coming through in highly attenuated fashion into consciousness. Now, if this were merely a phenomenon that we see in psychic disorders, we could say, well, the confabulation of consciousness is no big deal. But in fact, it occurs every day in all, in all of our lives. So there have been experiments like this. The researcher will show the subject a sheet, and there are four pictures of women on the sheet. And the researcher asks the subject, which of these four women do you think is the most attractive? And the subject will point to one of the four women. Then the researcher removes the sheet, engages the subject in conversation for a couple of minutes, and then comes out with a different sheet with the woman's picture on it, except the picture he shows the subject is not the same woman that he chose in the initial uh, comments. And then the researcher will say, well, what was it about this woman that you found particularly attractive? And the subject will go on and enumerate all of the features in now the different woman that made him choose her as particularly attractive. Why does that happen? Because the expectation would be you would see the same woman, so consciousness simply confabulates. It simply substitutes the new woman for the old woman without the subject ever being conscious of this. This happens all the time in little ways every day of our lives. In other words, consciousness is a very adept liar. So now we come to our present situation, going back to our other thread of the cognitive non-conscious. The more information we have in the 20th and 21st century, the more we need automated cognition. The more we have automated cognition, the more we can handle the information we have, which leads to more information, which leads to more need for automated cognition. In other words, we're now at a point where we're in a self-catalyzing feedback loop. The non-conscious cognizer illustrated here is at the top of the food chain of non-cognitive cognizers, a self-learning robot that has language cap capability, processing, and learning possibilities. But most of the cognitive non-conscious um, cognizers in our environment are not of the self-learning robot kind, very expensive. They're small devices scattered throughout our environment. So Neil Kirschenfeld in her, his book, When Things Start to Think, talks about smart buildings, smart environments, smart cars, more and more cognizers that are not conscious operating throughout our environment. So I would not choose the word thinking. I would choose the word uh, cognizers. And where are these found? Well, Cisco estimates by 2015 there will be 25 billion devices connected to the internet. 
This is kind of the leading edge of the rise of the cognitive non-conscious. When there are small individual cognizers operating on their own, they have limited abilities, sometimes very limited abilities. But connected into networks and put on the internet, they now become a cognitive system with emergent properties and greatly enhanced cognitive abilities. So 25 million of these non-conscious cognizers, the human population right now is estimated to be 7.1 billion. So in other words, it's safe to assume that there are now more non-conscious cognizers on the planet than there are conscious cognizers, including human beings. So then when these things get together into networks, they have sensing, processing, communi communicating, and actuating capabilities that surpass or, in fact, bypass human agency with the possibility for emergent qualities. Give you just one simple example. You turn on your cell phone and you get a message that reads something like searching for signal. What's actually going on in those few seconds is that your cell phone is undergoing a, a number of handshaking protocols with other non-conscious devisers to assure your device access to the telephone network you're using and so forth. A whole stream of communication obscured from your vision and indeed even from your awareness. So more and more, these kinds of machine-machine cognitive messages are humming all the, all the way around us, outside of our kin, outside of our awareness. So this now is a landscape in which contemporary humanities are located. And I'd like to suggest that List the Landscape poses some new challenges for the humanities. Meaning across all of the humanities, art, literature, history, philosophy, has always been central to the mission of the humanities. And in fact, that it should be central has never really been questioned up to this point. But now we have a whole world of non-conscious cognizers for whom meaning has no meaning. What does this imply then for the mission of the humanities at the contemporary moment? It almost forces us to ask what exists beyond meaning, beyond interpretation, and beyond hermeneutics. Now one of the sites to look for this is the digital humanities. But what I'm suggesting here in this larger landscape in that is that the digital landscape is on, excuse me, digital humanities is, for all of its diversity, only one site within this much larger landscape. So we can trace a kind of trajectory that I'll just sketch here in kind of comic book form for lack of time. So 1950s, we have the new criticism with a new methodology, close reading, which is rapidly incorporated into literature studies, history, et cetera. Then we have deconstruction with a fairly complicated methodology aimed at destabilizing meaning. Now we have, in the 21st century, biopolitics and the movement to population statistics and risk, where close reading techniques are of extremely limited use. We have the advent of digital analytics, which are looking for patterns rather than meaning. And now we have the capacity to invent media which modulate life capacities at population levels below the individual, genetics and genomics, for example, and above the individual, uh, calculating risk and statistical tendencies within populations, for example. So we are now at a position I'd like to suggest that we could call the agon, the meeting of struggle and 
competition and also co cooperation, where consciousness meets the cognitive non-conscious. Already, I think we are beginning to see frameworks of um, philosophical uh, interpretations that are beginning to sketch out what this confrontation between the conscious and the non-conscious might look like. So, for example, in a recent uh, issue of New Literary History, Sharon Marcus and Stephen Best were arguing for what they called surface reading, uh, arguing against uh, deep hermeneutics. Um, and one way this could be staged is that as a kind of uh, contest between interpretation and description. One of the scholars who attacked Marcus and Best in this issue uh, made the point, which I think is sensible, that there is no description without interpretation. In a recent, pers in a recent um, presentation I heard Sharon Marcus give, she made the opposite observation, there is no interpretation without description. So what we might argue then is that interpretation and description interpenetrate at every point. This is especially important for the digital humanities where discerning patterns can be thought of as description, but that description already implies interpretation just as explicit um, explication of those patterns uh, also is interpretation. So we see this movement of the engagement of the conscious uh, thinking with the cognitive non-conscious in these kinds of ways. Another sort of implication of this larger landscape is that there will be renewed attention on that boundary between material processes that underlie the cognitive non-conscious and the cognitive non-conscious as such. So Jane Bennett in her book, Vibrant Matter, is interrogating precisely that kind of boundary and attributing to material processes a new kind of agency. Luciana Parisi is talking about the way that that missing half second between perception and consciousness can be uh, the target for uh, media that give a kind of uh, future anterior sense that is target a level below, below conscious perception that nevertheless will affect and attune the, um, the prehensive body and so that when it appears again at the level of consciousness, it's experienced as a kind of deja vu and desire for repetition. So she's talking about this particularly in the area of branding. We get something like Ray Brassier's Nihil Unbound, where he's working through very complex uh, philosophies like those of Nietzsche, Badiou, La Ruelle, and so forth to essentially make the argument, although he wouldn't put it like this, that meaning is a kind of uh, ghetto in which consciousness has confined us for too long. He's looking for a way out of that ghetto to make connection not with the Kantian correlation as circle, the universe for us because we perceive it through our perceptions, but a way for the universe in itself and the way that he chooses to make this uh, journey from meaning to non-meaning is precisely to argue that non-meaning is the, the ultimate encountering and embracing non-meaning is the way to make a connection with the universe in itself. And then we have Mark Hansen in Media for the 21st Century, again, discussing how the new, new media will be targeting that missing half second. So in different ways, all of these thinkers are thinking about the encounter of consciousness with the cognitive non-conscious, uh, trying to develop a theory, a mode, a methodology, a way of thinking, that will see this not as an anomaly, but rather as a new landscape where the humanities will undertake new kinds of tasks and come to new conclusions. Thank you.